It's the Endo meeting on Wednesday, June 14th, 2023. Uh, we have guests from Sprightly. Uh, we have, and we have uh, some additional folks from Agoric this week. Um, the, the topic that I would like to bring up at this meeting is um, with regard to uh, the endo pet daemon, which is our node in a distributed hardened JavaScript eventual send graph, uh, how to do, um, how, how, uh, basically, by the way, what are, what are the cryptographic needs and possible solutions for peer-to-peer? Uh, we were speaking last week about uh, uh, up to this point, Endo has been the Endo pet daemon has been largely a user agent running on uh, running on a local machine that confines guest programs and connects them to browser extensions and possibly even web pages but does not, we have not fully reasoned out the peer-to-peer -peer arrangement. And of course, also it, we haven't reasoned out three-party handoff and these problems look very similar. In fact, when I was talking to Brian about what to do about three-party or not, not even three-party handoff, just talking about how we authenticate and transfer uh, references between peers, not even third party handoff, just first party, first to second, uh, that we were thinking, uh, Brian suggested that I look into the elliptic curve ED25519. Yes, I can memorize seven digit numbers in a day. <laughs> it is seven, right? And <laughs> in any case, um, and it, and looking and and that prepared me when looking again at Ocapen to notice that hey they're doing something as well with elliptic curves of with that exact same number for three party handoff which is interesting, um, and uh, I also learned that uh, Dave Thompson's uh, David Dave or David either is fine but most people call me Dave Dave. Uh, Dave recently re uh, implemented an alternate le net layer for Goblin's Ocapen, which stands on top of TLS with mute with self-signed certificates on both sides, and uh, and then additionally elliptic curves for three-party handoff, which I'm coming to be better able to understand, given that there's some rhyming reason between what we've prototyped in the Endopet daemon. In particular, the Endopet daemon provides um, in its at its bootstrap object, it has a provide function, which takes a pet name and then gives you the corresponding reference. Uh, that feels like it might be similar to fetch. I'm not sure. Um, uh, in in any case, uh, there are additional methods that Goblins implements on the conventional bootstrap object that facilitate three party handoff. And uh, so. Um, that's that's the framework. Uh, the rest of this conversation, probably in order to be the most productive for me, is a conversation between me and Mark, uh, and possibly with Brian over our shoulders telling us about other ideas um, about the peer-to-peer -peer semantics, resuming our conversation about the peer-to-peer -peer semantics with Endo, which I now better understand, and uh, but also have not written anything down since last week. So it, uh, I would not, um, um, I would not object to, uh, uh, hesitation to continue in that direction without me thinking a little bit more first, I'm open to any direction there. Um, so that that's, that's the situation by way of context. If I, uh, if, uh, in order to respect David's, uh, but attendance at this meeting and the opportunity that that affords, I'd love to hear more about what OCAPN, what, what the new net layer that you've implemented uh, concretely is doing as just a matter of transfer of information. I don't want this to be uh, a standardization conversation. <laughs> I, I just, I would like to receive an understanding of what you've implemented. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that it's it's currently a very experimental and a partial implementation of what we really want. Um, but the the genesis of the idea was essentially that right now goblins can 
uh, talk Okapin over Tor Onion services. It happened to be a, an easy thing for Christine, the sprightly CTO, to figure out. Um, but what we would like is something that's just kind of using more readily available stuff that people understand, you know, uh, TCP, TLS, you know, anyone that uses the web knows that. Um, so we thought, okay, can we get, it's not a true peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, but can we make something uh, work that way? You know, we're, you know, I'm using Zoom over web browser right now, you know, WebRTC, it's doing something similar to hook, to hook everybody up to talk to each other. So um, what we're doing is, you know, the, the, the peers uh, that, that are, you know, well, I guess I'll just talk about two, maybe two uh, people talking to each other, two machines. Um, it's simply opening a TCP socket. Um, how you find the machine to connect to is a matter of um, what in the OCAP and draft spec is uh, currently a, a URI uh, whose host identifier is a, a hash of, the, of a self-signed X509 certificate. Um, that is the identity of the machine. And then there are hints that might give you information about where to find the machine, say uh, a DNS host name in a port. And with that information, you can connect to a remote machine. That remote machine then presents you, uh, presents the client with its X509 certificate, which the client then compares to the hash to see if it is uh, the machine that uh, you know, you're connecting the machine you think you're connecting to. And if everything looks good, the client uh, then uh, trusts that, um, that certificate. So there's no certificate authority involved. The, the certs are self-signed. It adds it to its, uh, uh, the session's trust store and initializes the TLS handshake. So at that point, uh, in terms of what an OCAP and net layer is, uh, we've satisfied the requirements in, in the sense that our net layers need to just provide a secure means of communication between two parties. And by um, secure, you mean yeah. you mean confidential over the wire? Uh, Correct. And, yeah. and with TLS, the 509 is also serving as uh, the verifiable identity of your interlocutor. Yeah, that's that's correct. So the <clears throat> excuse me. So the, yeah, the certificate provides um, you know it's a public private key thing. So the public key is the identity of 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 the machine, the remote machine, and um, so there's there's an encrypted channel and also the TLS protocol. So I'm not like an encry like a encryption security expert anyway, but um, neither am I. Encrypted. That's why we. Don't. Um, but over over TLS, you know, it it provides more than just like an encrypted connection. It also has like anti eavesdropping features, which would make if there was someone sitting in the middle, it would um, it, if someone was like watching the traffic go by in the middle, TLS makes it pretty hard to like suss out like patterns of what's happening over there. Um, so so TLS is more than just like encrypting what's going on. It's also trying to prevent like someone gleaming something about the pattern of traffic going across the wire. So there's features there that I don't quite understand, but are are useful. I, I wouldn't lean too heavily on that. It's it's <laughs> really intended to make sure that two equally sized packets sent at the same time are indistinguishable yeah. from each other. But sure, yeah. So the primary reason we're using TLS is because it's ubiquitous. Um, so rather than trying to come up with something else, uh, just using familiar things like the, there's a TLS implementation for anybody in any language, whatever they want to do. So TCP TLS is well understood. If we could do that. And we get rid of the whole CA thing. It's just because the OCAP and URIs contain the identity of that machine, we have a means to verify that the key that that the server is using is is the one that we we trust. Because presumably the person that gave us the OCAP and UI URI is someone we trust. Um, things are good, and at that point we have that encrypted secure channel, and OCAPing can happen on top of it. Um, I see Dan Connolly asking a question in the chat, so let me just read that real quick. Is confidentiality required by an OCAP and NetLayer? I think this integrity is the more relevant property. Yeah, I think. Um, let, let me let me just yeah. say. Go ahead. If if the so when you say uh, because you said OCAP as opposed to simply what it is that you're doing, uh, uh, chains public chains um, uh, conventionally cannot keep secrets 
So it can't be a general OCAPN requirement if we're going to include communication with chains. But I'm very, very happy to get confidentiality where it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, and if we, could, if we could find a way to say it gives you, OCAPN gives confidentiality where it's possible, I would be very happy with that. Yeah, so I think, you know, probably Jessica or Christine would be better to speak on like the, what the like, if, if there's a must here or not. But I think, you know, what so, we're thinking about is like, we're talking yeah. over the internet and we don't trust that as gen generally speaking. So if we're, if we're communicating between two machines over the internet, we want a secure channel. If we're well, talking sure. about like in interprocess on, on the same machine, you know, you, unencrypted Unix domain sockets might be fine for that. No, yeah, the, the, the unencrypted Unix domain sockets actually give you um, uh, both integrity and confidentiality. Correct. Um, uh, so that's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, with regard to the untrusted networks, uh, integrity solves the fundamental problem of untrusted networks. You've got to have integrity or you don't have anything. But once you have integrity, then it's a separate decision whether you also have confidentiality. So... Sure. Um... To, to, uh, my hope is to get enough details about what uh, what David is or Dave, excuse me, is is doing concretely for us to examine that after uh, once we've gotten to the end. Um, it is an interesting question to me whether having the TLS identity be uh, conflated with uh, the ent identity that is needed at a higher layer for three-party handoff is a, t a detail that I'm very interested in discovering in, in the course of your explanation. Sure. Um, right. So actually, so I was not involved in the implementation of our third-party handoffs. And in writing a net layer, I just, like, I know for those that are at the OCAPN meetings, I know that there's been some discussion back and forth about like, uh, is the net layer relevant to the third party handoff and in, in, in there are different uh, feelings either way. Um, but when I, when I wrote this, um, I didn't have to consider how the, the, the handoffs work. Like the way our abstractions work is that if I just provide the, like the socket, the thing to communicate over and set it up in whatever way is appropriate for the medium. And in my case, just a, T, a TCP socket with a, you know, I, I do the TLS handshake hand that off and then the you know the OCAPN implementation is ready to use it. So um, third party handoffs there like don't the, the way we've written them do not care about um, what like what medium they're 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 going over. Uh, it just needs something. You know in in scheme we call them ports. You have a port you can do IO uh, everything happens over that. Um, let's see. Oh TLS without CA it sounds like the URL stuff, but Tyler close at all. In, in, in any okay. case, this was a direction that I, my intuition was yeah. going to take me in the direction that you have gone so okay. far. Yeah. Then I talked to Brian, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Is, is that, is that the Libsodium thing? Um, yes. Well, yeah, Libsodium yeah. is going to be involved in the three-party handoff anyway, because it's ultimately that's, that's our ED25519 implementation. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, on and Goblin side, we're we're using uh, libgcrypt uh, at the moment for for all that stuff. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, I'll say the, the, pause there. The the, the TLS uh, implementation you've pursued is very much like what I did with Fool's Cap. We're both coming from the same uh, lineage here. Uh, I got that inspiration from Markham stuff and from from uh, Tyler stuff. Um, what we learned with Fool's Cap, one of the limitations there is that to implement that, you need to be able to override some validation hooks inside the TLS library to say, hey, I need to be told when you learn the other side certificate so I can hash it and make a decision. That limits you to environments where you can get at those hooks. So like doing that from within a browser, I never found any good way of doing that from within a browser. Ah, interesting. Um, so we, yeah, we've been working with the GNU TLS library. That's like yeah, what the if you, implementation we've been using. So. Yeah, if you, if you get to reach that down to that level, then you can build this kind of thing. Um, I always found it a bit fussy because if I missed one of those callbacks or I kind of didn't check all this stuff, I was my code was volunteering to take over validation of a certain set of stuff by installing those callbacks. And if I failed to do something, then it opened up a bunch of, of, yeah. of attacks. Um, that was Just always a concern point. I had. Weber HTTP was mentioned, but uh, with Weber HTTP APIs, you might be you might have a little bit more flexibility in uh, there. Uh, yeah, without in a browser environment. Yeah, because uh, in the browser environment, yes, uh, WebSocket is definitely related to CAs and so on, but uh, web 
the way we're in C connections, you might have more flexibility there how things are validated. Yeah. Exploring like WebSockets as like a possible net layer option is something that we are interested in, but like since we're still kind of bootstrapping our way to running in a browser environment, uh, it's not really like on our on like on our plate yet, but um would be an interesting thing to explore. The reason I brought up WebRTC earlier was because one, one of the things that we haven't um, made happen yet is like we, we, we've made like a, a demo application that uses this experimental net layer. But the big caveat is that like we can't, you can't reliably do third party handoffs because if someone's sitting behind a NAT, you have to do hole punching in order to make that work. So anyway, like I guess like the overarching thing about this net layer is that we're just trying to make something that is relatively simple that can work for some, you know, uh, simple in, in air quotes, right? Because once you're doing hole punching, it's like maybe it's not that simple, but it's not a full peer-to-peer -peer network, like a libp2p or something like that, or Tor. Um, you know, we, we want something that was like simple enough, familiar enough that like people could, you know, m get started and like bootstrap an application uh, that way, like a distributed application that way. So maybe not like the world's greatest thing, um, but, but usable for, you know, the, the use cases for which it applies. So well, having so this this is an interesting thing, is I my expectation is for us to converge first on OCAP and semantics, and then converge on the concrete message framing, or well, the the inside of a message, and then after that, I imagine that we're not going to be able to choose a single transport. <laughs> I, I imagine we are not we are definitely not going to be able to select a single transport we're going to need to haul this over everything that we possibly can and um yep. and, and that sends us off more in the direction of live tp p2p with for the purposes of uh, having the address but not 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 the um identity but to have the um the hints about how to create a connection be extensive the the standardization group hasn't gotten too much into it, at least for the meetings I've been present for. Um, but there is like Jessica on the sprightly side that has, you know, started work on like a draft specification for like the net layer thing because that's that's not present in the draft cap TP spec. It's like another thing. But that's that's the idea, Chris. Is that like all of the the transport is kind of generic? Like we we've made a general like we, the the cap TP sits above that. And we can make it work over whatever transport is appropriate for the application being built. Um, so when you, when you say whatever transport, I assume you still rely on some specifics of the transport layer. So in order delivery and guaranteed delivery, right? Yeah, I think it would have to have something like that. So for, for example, like one, one thing I've been curious about but haven't explored is like what I'm currently doing is over TCP, which has the ordering uh, guarantees. Uh, but it, it would be interesting because I like to do game stuff. Is if if you could get anything over UDP that had the the right the right qualities. But I'm not like a, a super networking engineer, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, but yeah, I think there it would have to have some basic properties. But there are many things that satisfy that, so people can take their pick. And right. So and for the moment, I do not want to. I do not want to take the lid off of that can. Um, <laughs> The, because the one, I have done that before. <laughs> the, the one thing I would mention that's lurking inside that can, like the, the thing that leaks through some of these abstractions is connection oriented versus connectionless. That if you kind of go in a connection oriented thing, then you're saying the net layer is responsible for providing a new connection, a signal when the connection is lost, agreement on both sides, a connection has been lost, how to set up a new one. And once you have that, then you can say there's not, there's some cryptographic identifier that talks about who I'm talking to. There are some hints that aren't bound into that that talk about where I talk to them um, and different ways of distributing those hints or doing redirects or whole bunching or whatnot. Um, but the, a different category of approach that gives you some different properties that you might want is a more connection less thing where you say connections are an illusion anyway, don't rely upon that. And that I think leads to a very different set of protocols. And so, you know, I, I, I've done a bunch of the connection oriented ones, but I've always wanted to do a more pure connection less one because I thought it was was more honest to what the network is actually giving you. I would be curious. And to, it may give you more flexibility about some of the transports you go over. Yeah, I'd be curious to know like an example of something that you would would consider connection less. And then I, I could look to see if that would like fit our, I'd, our current... I'd, abstraction the prior art that I was actually implemented would be uh, Tyler Close's waterkin server and the general notion of um, 
I have a bunch of messages that are outbound that get embargoed until I commit my state to avoid hangover inconsistency. And then there's a transport layer that's responsible responsible for getting those messages to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I don't care how it does it, if it has a connection, if it doesn't. But the connection thing is like opportunistic, and you're not relying on the connection um, for any of the signaling that says it's it's there, it's gone properties. Yeah, I, I think I think I think we need to be careful about levels of abstraction here. You're not relying on the um, you know, the TCP connection, but what you're doing is you're implementing a, a connection uh, on, on top of UDP in the same sense the TCP implements a connection on top of IP. Yeah, yeah. You, you may have more flexibility, like you could give your network layer instructions to say, this message needs to be delivered before this one or after this one. Um, it doesn't have to tell the uh, and the notion of a connection going away might be the peer is dead i i have decided i'm never going to talk to them again i'm allowed to tell some clients that the references are broken um but you don't necessarily have to do a kind of sturdy ref live ref split interesting so uh, is I, again in order to make the best use of your time david i would like to learn more um the so at this point, uh, something I don't know that you might not be able to answer is actually starting to to uh, to dig into the three party handoff because I think that's where the the next layer of encryption gets interesting. Uh, and and please forgive me for not having made a thorough and and, and ingested a thorough read of the specifications so far. I, I will do my best and I'll tell you when I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, my understanding now is that the implementation of three-party handoff in OCAPN presumes, uh, seems to, uh, it, no, it definitely presumes that all three parties have active sessions with each other in a click. Well, the triangle, the most primitive of clicks. <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> I, I don't know if it assumes that they're all open. I think it's just maybe that they have at once talked to each other such that they have the information that they need to send messages. Okay. Um, it's what possible if, that in the handoff process, someone's gone and it just won't work. Like the handoff will fail. Okay, so uh, yeah, the important, the important case for three-party, the general case is uh, 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 machine site B, machine B, whatever you want to call it, uh, and C have never heard of each other before uh, Alice introduces Bob to Carol. So Alice has to explain, uh, or, or A has to explain to B uh, enough about C's identity that B can try to find a connection to C. And then once uh, every time B finds a possible connection, uh, B can authenticate that this is the C that A meant. And, yes. uh, and the yes. meaning of that across different transports uh, is there's there's not going, to, I don't see any way to prevent um, the net layer identity issue uh, from being represented somehow in the serialization of Carol as sent to Bob. So uh, there, therein lies the question. Um, my, I'm told that above a certain level in CAPTP, we are only talking about parties in terms of their identifiers, not their addresses. Um, so how, how do, uh, is, is, uh, so my question, so a concrete question, a hypothesis is that this other layer, the bootstrap object that all OCAP and implementations are required to present for the purposes of three-party handoff has a few methods pertaining to gifts. Do does the gift does the gift contain the connection hints? I am I have the spec open right now because I'm trying to remember the exact structure of the gift. Um, uh, this place that I'm at does not have it. So presumably, Alice, Alice has hints for connect has has them ha, has established the means to connect to both Bob and Carol, and needs to transfer a hint 
from uh, from uh, transfer a hint from Alice to Bob in order for Bob to establish a connection to Carol. So there, there's there's two there's two aspects, both of which are bleeding of net layer concepts uh, into uh, CAPTP. I mean that seem to be necessary. One is the routing hints, and they're hints because um, uh, uh, they can be wrong and uh, it does, shouldn't compromise your security. Not part uh, of the except, identity. Yeah, right. and, and it might compromise your availability if none of the hints are good enough to make to succeed at creating a connection. But then the other thing is the authentication information so that once B has an alleged connection to, to some to, to some C, to an alleged C, that B can authenticate this is the C that A meant. Uh, and, and I just don't think there's any universal way to do that. I'll, I'll add a couple of other requirements that we've come to understand better with working with chains. B needs to be able to emit a message into the world that can be seen by C and nobody else. You know, if you want confidentiality, B needs to have some notion of how to successfully encrypt something in a way that only C can get it. C needs to be able to validate a message that arrives from the internet, knowing it's coming from the same B that A said the gift is intended for. Cool. So to the extent there are identifiers there, those are kind of uh, uh, abbreviations for or, or um, merging together separate purposes. So one thing you may want to think about, especially in the context of chains, is to not conflate the thing I need to send out to somebody with the thing I need to recognize, the recognition predicate I use to recognize somebody else. Yeah. In, a, in a TLS style public key kind of thing, it's the same string, the same hash of a, a certificate that's used for both purposes, but not in all environments. So yes, so for, for us, third-party handoffs, um, the, the fact that, you know, in, in this thing I've been talking about, we've set up connections that are encrypted over TLS. Uh, none of that, none of that detail gets to what's in the messages that are sent for doing handoffs. Um, every, um, every machine has a public private key pair, and that's a distinct public private key pair than what's like the X509 certificate that's being used in this case. Um, you know, uh, we could do we do this over we've done this over Tor that's like our main thing we've been using and you know those those certs and stuff they're not there at all um, and so and yes and I believe it's an ED two five five one nine key in our case um, and there's message signing going on so because we're introducing a party to another um, we have signatures in, in various parts of these messages that are being sent and in the the gifts that uh, Chris Chris brought up. And those signatures, well, I can't, I can't, I don't have the whole thing in my head of exactly like the step-by-step -step process. Those signatures are how um, the parties can know that if you're if you're introducing Bob to Carol, it's how it's how that they can they can know it's really um, like that's really Carol or yes, really Bob. Because Sorry, Alice, I'm, I'm turning myself around, but yeah, Alice I hope, has, I hope it made some sense. Alice is so so. If I'm understanding, Alice has yeah. signed a message sent that message to Bob, the contents of that message are um, the identity of Bob and presumably also connection hints. Yeah, so I, I see in the handoff give descriptor in the CAPTP draft spec um, that Jessica wrote, there's um, uh, something known as the exporter location, which is commented as an OCAP and session locator. So that's the means by which um, whoever's getting this 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 hand like whoever is getting this message can find the other party. So an OCAP and session locator would presumably be an object that will the a, a scheme that will evolve over time yeah. to include uh, details about all of the different net layers that are possible, such that you could do something similar to what IPFS does, where it says that the address of this thing can be any of these things including all of these different routes and protocols sure. and and they they can be nested within each other like dolls yeah presumably it could yeah it could be something that like here are all the various ways that you can connect to this i think like right now definitely in our implementation right now it's 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 simple in that the there's only one way to get to to well, reach, now, the, right? reach the other party yeah. um and mm. i don't know i don't know if jessica and christine like what what they have in mind is that like well you would try a handoff over another 
you know, net layer, which would be another identifier, another URI, a different one, if that other one failed. Like, I don't really know if they have like, no, this handoff should encode everything, all the possible ways, or if it would be a series of handoffs trying different things. I don't, I don't really, I couldn't say, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't think we want to like, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I don't think we want to like recruit preclude like having other means of connection versus just like well, well, know, what GCP, I like, we don't have to do that what my my intuition is that as i implement this i will likely make it possible to i will foresee yeah. i will foresee yes. having lots of different transport i will take that down as a question to ask them like what they think about doing handoffs in in the presence of multiple means of connecting to the third party Wait. For for and, reference, the the full the full scap experience with this was our your our furls our our connector identifiers had a list of connection hints. Each one of those was tried in parallel. All the negotiation is taking place in parallel with everything, and we get a single winner. So the layer above only observes I've established a connection to this particular key. You can send messages through it, and I'll send it back to you. But then it also had a bunch of signaling to say I've lost that connection. I've established a new mm -hmm. one. They had to react to. And the only wiggle I think that we would introduce to that is that some edges are not going to be explorable given where you're standing on the client. So if you're in a web page, for example, you're going to filter out everything except WebSocket or... or for or, sure. The, the hints each have a type. Some of them you are capable of. Some of them the person you're talking to is capable of. Yeah. And sometimes you will need a relayer to be in there somewhere, et cetera. Yeah. Did, um, uh, did you do the... Uh, I think this is probably directed at Brian. Did you do the, um, I forget what we called it, the, the protocol that we used in Water 10 and in E um, that meant that all every, every location that you mentioned in a hint could be the endpoint or could relay. You didn't yes. have to know if it was a relay. Yeah, okay. you, you, could, you could talk to one of those hints and it would tell you a different hint or a new set okay, of hints good. to explore. Good, good. Yeah, the, the redirector. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the next question for David is, um, when, um, in terms of layering, the, the, I, I think that, well, I, I don't, we don't need to dig in this into this very far. You've already answered two very good questions, one of which is that you have two layers of, uh, two kinds of identity. Um, you have the, the X509 identity that's, not, that's interesting for the purposes of uh, authenticating a connection. And you also have a layer of identity for signing three-party handoff. And so, so each, of, each of the goblins nodes has different identities for different purposes. Let, let me inject a caution there. If you've got two separate keys for a given node, you need to consider what happens if somebody presents one but not the other. Like I'm telling you to talk to B and I'm giving you B's authentication key, but I'm giving you somebody else's encryption key. And so in those kinds of systems, you usually want to have some kind of binding, bidirectional binding. So when B presents that pair of keys, there's something in the first key that says, I want to use this second key. And there's something in the second key that says, I want to use this first key. And everybody receiving that refuses to use either one unless they see a matched pair that both talk about each other. And so for example, I believe that Brian was talking to me about a system where there are similarly multiple key pairs that we were going to use at 25519. Uh, <laughs> Ed two five hour nine. Ed Edwards Ed, two to the two fifty five minus nineteen. Yeah, use that as the basis, and then use one to sign uh, to sign ephemeral keys for the other. Um, uh, it, it, I think something like that. Something like that. A reason I like the connection list systems is you can say do TLS whatever. We don't care about what that key is. We're doing something else to talk about the identity of the other side in a way that only has one key instead of trying to somehow have two different things talk about each other. Uh, similarly, perhaps it's possible to use the X509's key pair to sign. Uh, Te technically, yes, but then you have to like get into the guts of the library to do it, and you'll it'll probably go wrong. Yeah, yeah, for for us, we like that like X509 stuff we're doing is like orthogonal to everything above it, so it's like that. That's great, and if you never actually look at the identity of the other side, then you won't be vulnerable to any of these sorts of problems. Yep. But like the full scap approach is the hash of this X509 certificate is the identity of the other side. And yes. if I tried to use any second key, I'd have these problems. And it sounds to me like that's exactly what's going on here at one layer. 
Um, yeah. So that so so yeah, a word of caution, Brian. Brian is, is signaling a word yeah. of. I am full of cautions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Where, the, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Whereas alternately, what we would prop, what, what what we would need to do would be uh, if we were using TLS, we would use self signed certificates to create an eavesdropping uh, a, a connection that is that that preserve, preserves confidentiality over the network, but then ignore the identities and only use the ed to now so the if you do tls to somebody else you're talking to somebody if you don't have a notion of who you intended to talk to then you might be talking to a man in the middle who is reading everything you're know, decrypting it reading it re-encrypting it and so if you want confidentiality that has to be relative to or bound to a particular identity so opportunistic tls is great it protects you against a whole bunch of passive attacks it puts the, the bar of effort on the attacker to be pretty high, but it doesn't actually get you the kind of confidentiality you think you're getting unless you do the, the hash of the certificate to check or you so, do your own encryption over that thing and you say, great, that's you know best effort, but we don't rely on it. And that could be as simple as a signature handshake at the beginning of the TLS stream, right? Uh, no, that tells you it's complicated. Um, it, it doesn't tell you that the you need you need to bind it to the encryption keys that are being used for the session. So if you don't get to find out what the certificate, the X509 certificate of the other side is, or you don't get to find out anything about the session key inside, then you don't know that the, the attacker isn't just passing that signature through without doing anything, you know, still having two separate encryption sessions, but just passing through your plain text. Yeah, we, yeah, I, you know, we we really don't love like x5 like working with x509 yeah and no, so one of the questions last effort. yeah so one, of the, <laughs> one of the questions we had was like well you can do like anonymous like like diffie hellman like stuff with with tls and you don't need the certs and then you know immediately it was like well man in the middle because exactly what you're saying someone could relay every if you're just signing yeah. the messages yeah the, the, the channel's encrypted but someone could sit right in the middle and just see everything you're sending, it's signed, but they have access to the full message and they'll just relay. So, so, so as mentioned uh, in, in the comments here, uh, there's a library called Noise, which is kind of the, the more modern thing to do if you want a connection oriented, stream oriented thing. And it has a bunch of really interesting forward security, forward secrecy properties as well. But it's basically a way to say, here's here are my key materials, here are the messages that need to go back and forth. And then you get these, um, uh, a, a confidential, authenticated connection bound to a particular identity key that gives you a set of messages you send back and forth over whatever transport you want. Hmm. TLS is giving you the same kind of thing, but 30 years earlier and really focused on a browser, you know, right. CA model that isn't really appropriate here. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I definitely want to acknowledge that like, yeah, the CA model, not, not appropriate at all. And again, it's, it's, it's ubiquity that's making us like sure. kind of look. So, so what we would probably do, and again, this is very, this is the only point at which this touches the OCAP and effort is how we signal that we're using different net layers. Like is uh, the net layer that we would be interested in pursuing would pro like, based off of what I'm hearing from Brian and from you, David, my inclination would be to not use TLS, to use our message framing, uh, use an arbitrary, uh, use any of the many message framing protocols that we will, that we're, that we need to use for various purposes, WebSocket being one of them. Um, and then within those message framing protocols, use ed two one two five five one nine in order to um, in order to encrypt the individual messages. Especially given that we're not really um, that the TLS isn't actually giving us secrecy about the message sizes. The, the, you know, the high order bit, from my point of view, is connection oriented versus connectionless, and what is the identity of the peer. Mm -hmm. um, to, to what Chris was saying about just encrypting each individual mes message, I did raise that as a possibility for us. It's like, couldn't we just do that and not use TLS? But there was a uh, belief on our side from the other people at Sprightly that TLS is offering us more. I know, so Brian is dubious about that. And it, it would be really good for me to understand more about that because maybe I could make the case to drop it and like just do do what, what Chris is was doing. So if, if you proceed in that direction, it would be really nice to know about it, more about it, and, and why uh, you're, you're confident in it, because then that might be useful to us 
and then we can do this. We could maybe do the same thing if everything, if, every, if everyone is in agreement. So, I sure yeah. hope we won't, don't throw out web sockets without looking at it really, really hard. I, I would say web sockets are a lovely transport for encrypted frames, just yeah. like TLS, just like HTTP. Yeah, and given yes, and especially given that web socket is definitely going to be among the transports that we are all going to need. Um, I. Yeah. I can't wait till the point where we need to use WebSockets too. So, uh, <laughs> um, um, it, it, very lovely it, spec. I implemented uh, a client and server one. So it's yeah. Like yeah, it. my my expectation is that um, having the encryption right on top of the message framing would make most of our solutions more portable across different net layers. Um, uh, especially given that Live Sodium in particular has solutions and and all of the nicks and crannies that we want to use it. Um, uh, it, it can be used as a, it compiles down to WASM, for example, and can be run on the web. And, um, and noise is built entirely on top of the libsodium primitives as well. Okay. So those are, those are two things to put on the same page. Yeah. So looking into noise know. on my list as well, um, uh, uh, Serapath uh, provided a hint about that earlier. Um, the, uh, Okay. Is, is there a uh, standard widely used binding of libsodium to JavaScript? Yes. At this point, I think the recommendation is to compile the C version into WASM. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are there are a couple of bindings that do that. Um, Tweetnackle was kind of funny. Yeah, that's that's early hack stunt. <laughs> okay. uh, XS, XS has no WASM. Yeah, in that case, uh, I would take the C binding and expose it as um, what do they call them? Host Modules. functions modules in the I wouldn't, access world. I wouldn't do anything of the kind. I would just have it pumping frames out to the parent process and having it do the live sodium work. Um, since oh. it has a privileged file descriptor, or pardon, it has it has not a privilege. It has a file descriptor that we can that we're reasonably confident that only the kernel can eavesdrop upon. So, okay. um, yeah, just doing doing the messaging in a different places, probably in in the commsvat, for example, um, the or commsvat analog, I should say, since we're not talking about the chain. Yeah. Um, That's a good Interesting to hear a little bit about. Uh, how you do things in JavaScript land, especially when there's <laughs> C libraries involved. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. JavaScript is no one's here because they. I yeah. shouldn't say that. I, I I think it's a good observation that you have separation of concerns, and that means whatever is doing the transport stuff, whatever is doing the encryption, the authentication, is not like there's a layer that says I want message X to go to identity Y. And maybe there's something about sequencing or dependency, you know, ordering or something, but it hands it off to somebody else. And then somebody else is the one that knows what the crypto is to achieve those properties. And that doesn't have to be in the same process. So it doesn't have to use the same technology. Doesn't have to be on chain. Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 you wouldn't do most of the stuff on chain. You would, you would validate signatures of incoming messages. That's an appropriate thing to do in a transparent environment. But the recipient of your outbound stuff needs to know how to recognize messages from the chain. So it needs to know your voting protocol. So the recognition predicate is more than just, here's a pub key. OK. Um, how to proceed? Uh, I, I, I still need to, I still need to look in. I, I still would like to better understand exactly how much I, I think that it is acceptable for uh, the, con the concern of connection locations to leak into OCAPN above a certain layer. Um, I think, uh, and, and in any case, that, that's a conversation about standardization. I think that we've gotten the, the juice we wanted uh, in, in from this conversation and, uh, and hope to have a, a fruitful conversation going forward about the layering of OCAPN and where third-party handoff gets added on. Um, but I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm I, um, there's a layer at which it can be introduced that is optional because there's a layer underneath that where it's not necessary or useful and entrains dependencies that we don't want. 
And I will say for talking uh, in more detail about third-party handoffs here, and if, if you want some sprightly representation, Jessica, it would be really great to have her in on one of these. The reason she's not here today is because, Chris, you asked, you know, hey, yes, yesterday about joining this meeting. She lives in Sweden. So it's just like she, she knows about the OCAPEN meeting like a month in advance. So it's late for her there. So, but she's at that meeting. So uh, maybe with a little, like, if you, you know, we'll just schedule out a little bit and then maybe she'll take some time yeah, to. Sounds um, good. Sounds yeah. good. So uh, but, we have yeah, CP on there. ZB can commiserate about Central European time. Hello, ZB. <laughs> Thank you for, for being here. Um, the uh, Okay, I think that's enough for now. I'm, we're at 10 minutes to time. Um, I would totally dive into our side of this equation and start telling you things about what we're doing, um, but we're kind of close to time and I want to make sure that we honor MetaMask's time um, ZB, is there anything on your docket that needs our attention? Oh, okay. ZB's on a train. <laughs> Never <laughs> mind. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well then briefly, uh, my hope is that, uh, my hope is that you get a chance to take a look at the link to the demo video that I shared with you yesterday, wh where, uh, I went in January, went through the prototype of what the endo pet demon was putting together. It's coming along. Uh, there was a, a multiple months gap in there while I was on paternity leave. So I'm Rip Van Winkled my room uh, that work into the current era and just dusted it off this week. Um, and I'm doing a refactor and I'm working on, uh, I am in the midst of a conversation with Mark about the design. Uh, while we have you here, Mark, did you want to j talk about symbols in OCAPN? Uh, uh, yeah, um, the uh, and since since we're recording, let me also mention that um, uh, the, the the suggestion Chris made, which I, th I think is very interesting, um, uh, is also similar to uh, one that I heard earlier from uh, Michael. Um, but I'll just I'll just give my own spin on both. Um, the as I understand it, the normal way you do method or you know um, method invocation in Sprightly is that the uh, method name is a symbol, and symbols are one to one with strings, but they're di distinct from strings. Um, uh, uh, and OCAPN as a whole has both, I'm sorry, uh, Sprightly as a whole has both strings and symbols, but Correct. you don't have any particular use uh, internally, just within Sprightly for being able to use strings as method names. All of your method names are symbol named. Uh, yeah, and that's um, uh, by convention. Um, we have a, a, a helper, like a uh, macro that we tend to use to define methods and it uses symbols. So the, okay. you know, it would be the first argument, but um, we could dispatch on a string if we wanted. It's, it's a convention not required. Okay, so, um, and, uh, so, so we're in the same situation with the sign bit flipped. Um, uh, by convention, all of our methods are string named, uh, but we're in a language with both strings and symbols. Uh, and given and th that the OCAP and data model has both strings and symbols, uh, which is the situation that we're, you know, the agreed situation that we're currently in, um, uh, then if Sprightly sticks with their convention uh, and it's reflected at the OCAP and layer and Agoric sticks with our convention and it's reflected at the OCAP and layer, that means that when Agoric wants to invoke a sprightly object or sprightly wants to invoke an agoric object, uh, you have to, uh, it, it adds to the unnaturalness. Now there's always gonna be unnaturalness in crossing language conventions because there's just lots and lots of, of idiosyncratic language conventions. But this is sort of an additional unnaturalness tax on top of everything else. The alternative that, um, uh, I think we should seriously examine is 
that, uh, like I said, I'm gonna give my own spin on it. I'm not claiming to speak for either Chris or Michael here, is that in the same way that we have defined a tagged, a tagged data type and said that the tag name is a string, uh, and I expect that any representation inside OCAPN will say, well, we're going to decode the tagged into something local to us in which we translate the tag name string into a symbol. And since, and if you only translate it into a symbol, then, um, and you do it by, in both directions, then there's no non-conformity. You're just interpreting how to decode the OCAP and tagged into something local. You're not deviating from the fact that, that the tag name is a string in just the same way that in current oak happen, the name of a symbol is a string and you have to still decode the, the named symbol into a symbol. So in the same, in the same manner, we could say that if, if, if at the data layer, we, if we moved into the data layer, the definition of a data type called, let's say invocation that had a, a recipient, a optional method name um, uh, and an argument list. Uh, and then we can, uh, uh, and then there's a, a separate, you know, if we did such a thing, there would be a separate controversy which we'd need to resolve about whether we include the resolver for the resulting promise in the invocation or not. Let's leave that aside. Um, if we defined an invocation data type, then uh, it would, and, and if we defined it so that the method, the optional method name, if it were provided, were uh, a string, then it would be, uh, and we did not have a symbol type in OCAPN, it would be consistent with OCAPN for you to interpret the invocation as invoking a symbol named method where, this, the, where the symbol was the one named by the method name string. And for us to interpret the invocation uh, the method name part of the invocation as naming a string named method. And at that point, if we did that, then uh, I think uh, I, th I think that the um, the meaning of symbols to you and to us are sufficiently different and language idiosyncratic. And there is no such symbol type in uh, Cap and Proto. I think it's plausible that we could remove symbol completely from the data model by including invocation in the data model. Uh, and that would substantially reduce the impedance mismatch for us invoking your objects and you invoking our objects. And Chris, how, does, how well does that address your concerns even if it addresses it in a different way? I think that it does. Uh, it's close to where my initial thought was to use a tag type for methods, method names, um, and then for that to be reified into as a symbol and oh, and goblins and reified as a string in JavaScript. But that didn't pan out. That that line of reasoning didn't pan out because you can't use anything but symbols or strings as method names in JavaScript. So a tagged a tagged object wouldn't fit in that hole. Your invocation idea works. I think to to the same end, um, and I think that it does so in a way that uh, that makes the uh, that make that makes the construction of that tag type idiomatic in both languages. Um, the motivation is not my motivation is not that it's icky. <laughs> my motivation isn't that there's an impedance that there's an impedance mismatch for communicating between languages. That isn't sufficient. Uh, my argument is that. These need to be symmetric in order for us to be able to write protocols in terms of method invocation that are portable between the language languages. I would like it to be possible to implement a protocol, for example, an iterator protocol, or for example, never mind the iterator protocol. Terrible example. Let's talk about <laughs> let's use get interface of. 
Like if we if we wanted to create a a, a protocol where uh, a goblin's actor could implement a method for returning the pattern guard of the object of the API it implements in the same way that we interact with a JavaScript object, that would need to be in terms of either symbols or string names for the, or it would have to have a normalized method name representation. Um, and so that's one aspect of it. The second argument is that because JavaScript symbol registered symbols are a namespace that has meaning in JavaScript. Um, no, the, 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 the well-known symbols are, are yes. the ones that have meaning. The registered symbols are just string named and, and canon I mean, canonically string named, but, but not, I don't think there's any standardized meaning for any particular registered symbol. Are registered symbols disjoint with well-known symbols? Oh yeah, yeah. Terrible mistake, but yes, that's 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 the, one of the reasons why uh, I have a uh, issue for OCAP and conformity that I don't know how to solve. It. Fascinating. In yeah. any case, it stands to reason that there's no reason to have both. There is no reason in any language for us to have a represent have, have two representations of a method name. Um, and in fact, having two representations of a method name in OCAPN would make OCAPN inaccessible to certain languages. Um, so I move to normalize them. In, and if, if Mark's solution works, uh, if Mark's solution is palatable, I am, I am in, in favor of it. Okay. That would... so, so first to the OCAPN representatives here, uh, does this sound plausible? Well, I'll... I can jump in and, and well, I'll say that I would be really interested to hear what Jessica and Christine think. Uh, to me, it is, it's, in, it's interesting. I, I need to, I need to think about it. Um, but like to, to us, like, a, like for, for us, like uh, an actor's behavior is like an opaque function. It's like, like Lambda is our basic thing. It's not an instance with, with methods. Uh, the function could take no arguments. It could take, any number, it, the, the, the first argument could be interpreted any which way, it could be pattern matched any which way. Um, so to like uh, bring things down to the assumption, like having it be like, oh, there is a method, there is always a method name um, okay. is an interesting uh, change. Um, and I know, I think Mark, you've talked to at least either Jessica or Christine about this in, in the past too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I'd like to yeah. I'd like to catch up with them and see what see what they what they think about that. Because um, for us, it really is just a, a an actor gets an right. argument list, and, and it, it's interpret it's up to the actor to to interpret it. So like for me, I'm partial to like uh, you know I don't I don't I don't personally care if I had to send the an agoric actor a string as as the first argument for the method name it doesn't bother me. Um, uh, but I understand maybe like thinking it's icky um, too. Uh, but but it. would it, right? But would it be would it be uh, the on the flip side? Uh, how would you feel about an actor implementing a method that uh, I got a, a a scheme actor implementing a method where it specifically requires a string for the method name? Yeah, because and if that's that, yeah, yeah. yeah, I could see like that. I could see that happening because like I don't know, there's some existing system that say it was built with Agoric uh, stuff. And uh, we wanted to like put something that was interoperable with it in there or something like that. And like to do so, we had to implement yeah. the message pass. You know, we had to process the messages that those that system was already designed to build. So we would match against a string. I think that's okay. Um, uh, uh, like you know, we would write our own stuff to 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 you know, as our convention would be the symbol would be the the method. Yeah, and consequently, system. any yeah, consequently, any JavaScript. Pro the the real question is the real question to in order to motivate the additional complexity, there has to be a reasonable case in which something might accept either nothing for the method name, in which case it's a function call, or a string, or a symbol. And I, yes, my, my strong feeling is that this is more complexity than is needed, and it would hinder adoption of the protocol. Yeah. Um, so the, um, so I'm glad you, uh, so uh, David, I'm glad you brought up the 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 general actor perspective of goblins that that does i think make my idea not work or at least not work as is uh maybe i i think it's uh i wouldn't want to just uh 
throw it, throw it out like, uh, like that, I think it's definitely worth talking about because I think this topic has come up before. Like I've mostly been a listener at the standard standardization meetings and like I've heard this kind of stuff come up before. This topic's not gonna go away. Um, I think there, uh, we'll have to settle on something. Um, it's interesting. I think, you know, it's it's those two worlds, right? Is like, is your is your atom lambda or is it, you know, an, an instance, you know, and uh, you send messages to the instance and they're, uh, I think, you know, I was talking about this on IRC with Chris yesterday, you know, there's like a paper by Gael Steele where it's like, these are equivalent things, they're expressed differently. And how, you know, we- I we said that in, two, yeah. in my paper in 2000. Okay, well, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm familiar with the Gael Steele. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, Mark I think, isn't yeah. famous enough. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, <laughs> harness uh, Mark's name. Right <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that's kind of like, every time this comes up, it's kind of what I think about. It's like, oh, these, these things are the same, but like some people have a leaning towards one or the other. It's just the way it right. sort of comes to think. Just um, dri so driving on the left or on the right. You're, yeah, yeah, right. So, it, or or yeah. or you're in JavaScript. You're driving on both sides. Oh, yeah, yeah. With with an implicit this. Except right. symbols exist to not accidentally compete with the string name methods that were there already. Yeah, so, symbols do not exist in JavaScript for the same reason they exist in Lisp. Yeah. That much is certain. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and I know like you know a symbol type can be. Uh, foreign to some people in certain languages. Um, but I, you know, before I, I did Ruby professionally for like 10 years, that is a native symbol type. It's like, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I, I don't know, like dropping symbols altogether would make, um, you know, being in any, any Lisp or Ruby or something kind of weird because you kind of want symbols. You might want a symbol not only in the first, uh, in the uh, method name position, but you would also might want it as an argument. Um, or something in which case we'd have to like come up with some wrapper or something in any case i will yeah, not the, try to get into that but um yeah, I, yeah for, the, for us, symbols are very natural i, I um, will mention that we made a change relatively recently to encode in the gora platform to encode the method in a thing called meth arg so it's like you take the method thing and the arguments and you serialize that whole thing as opposed mm. to saying the method the method is a separate parameter to the underlying serialization layer specifically to handle symbols as methods. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, and, and let me let me just verify with you, Brian with you uh, that the methargs uh, is um, you know what what uh, you know in, in some object terminology would be or actor terminology would be the message. Yeah. Um, uh, it does not include the receiver and it does not include the resolver of the promise to reply to. That's right. That's right. Okay. The, the top the top level uh, thing that gets sent to the worker is target comma res resolution result promise if ever if any comma serialized meth arcs. Okay, so that triple uh, uh, would be the invocation with the, with where the uh, under the interpretation of the invocation including the promise result. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the and, fact that there is a result is special. The fact that there is a target is special. The methargs are kind of up to the recipient. Okay. All right. Well, I think that we can call it a meeting at this point. And I think that really the the question the the question for for the uh, the got the spike sprightly folks in general is um, whether it's palatable to erase symbols from the wire in every position except for method names and my suspicions that it's not and if that's the case then we need it yeah uh, it, it could it could be i, I don't want to um yeah there's I, a, yeah, yeah. i, I want to be like open to to any such things and also it's really also only somewhat my place to have like a strong opinion on it since uh J jessica's really leading the, leading the front here um so I've, I've done my best to take some notes down uh, about the interesting things from here. This has been a very interesting conversation. Um, so I'm gonna relay uh, as much as I can uh, to my colleagues. And I think if, if y'all can talk to Jessica sometime or Jessica and Christine or one of the other, I think uh, that would be good too. Okay. One of the things I think is really important high order bit I'm walking away with is that the yet to be negotiated issue of uh, function-oriented versus object-oriented 
and the um, uh, we hope to renegotiate issue of uh, of symbols or just strings uh, that those issues are coupled to each other. That's that's I think a really important takeaway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Thanks, and see some of you next time. That's cool. <laughs> Oh, this year, I just noticed your kid. <laughs> she just arrived. Uh, oh. She, oh, all right. Well, th thanks for the invite. This was uh, this was cool to. It was nice to talk to everybody. Thank you for coming. Bye.